So the reading is from Proverbs 3, verse 9 and 10. Honor the Lord with, with your wealth and with the first fruit of all your produce. Then your barns will be filled with plenty and your vats will be bursting with wine. come before you, your most holy word, and God, we tremble at your presence. God, we have experienced you, and we have known you, we have felt you in this place. God, not because you've turned up and you are going to leave, but God, because we have shut up and heard you. We've turned ourselves down, God, you, the abiding God, whose glory covers the earth as the waters cover the sea, that no land is out of your presence, that your spirit hovers over, God, the face of the deep still. God, that your spirit dwells in the life of each believer. And so, Lord, we pray that we would continue to walk in the light of your presence. Father, as we open your word this morning, we pray, my God, that you would speak to us. Father, you have expired your word to us, you breathed it out. And so, God, I pray that you will inspire our time together in order that we might be transformed for the gospel, by the gospel, through the gospel, and because of the gospel we pray. Father, we pray your richest blessing, God, on our time. We ask, God, that you would you would move so profoundly that, God, we would feel that our own souls are being examined by Christ himself as they are. Father, we pray there's any distractions. Father, we pray that your word will do its work. Father, and where I am completely in the way, I pray, my God, you will take over. God, we pray this in Jesus' name and for Jesus' glory. Take your seats, my friends. Take your seats. This morning, my dear friends, we are in Proverbs 3, 9 and 10, as Luke has read for us. Be prepared. It's not going to land the way you think it's going to do. I am challenged, bringing this word excited, in the sense that I believe God is going to speak to us, as he does clearly and profoundly as we meet together. It's been one of the most strenuous sermons to prepare for a very long time. Because I know it needs to land right and where I thought it was going, it wasn't going as I saw the Lord's face. And I think we kind of got there and if it's not quite as smooth as you would like it to be, then I make no apologies. For we're transformed by the power of God's word and his glory rather than our own. And the minute my words detract from the glorious gospel, everything's lost its power. Everything has lost its power. Our power is in the risen Christ, in the work he has done for us, by us, through us, and will continue to do in us. So to that which we will set ourselves on this morning, my friends. So God and wealth, here we are. Honour the Lord with those first fruits of your wealth and the first fruits of your produce. Then your barns will be filled with plenty and all your vats will be bursting with wine. That is a picture and not a reality. So please hear that some of you who may be wondering how that fits within the freedoms that have had to be curtailed for the sake of your life this morning. When the Bible talks of wine, it's not talking literally about wine, it's talking about God's blessing. When the Bible talks of oil, it's not talking literally, most often it's talking about God's spirit. So these are pictures it's not as literal, especially when we're in a text like Proverbs, literalism is not the forefront of what we are reading. So I just want to assure you by that this morning. So as we deal with wealth and possessions, uh, I want to take us on a journey. 
bit warm already. Um, where we will begin to reevaluate our wealth and its purposes in light of the gospel. In light of the gospel. We see many people today want to tell us what to do with our money, but they certainly haven't got gospel impetus behind them. They don't want to take it from us, or they want to use it to control us. Or they think Jesus is some Che Guevara figure, which he is not. So we want to reevaluate the light of the gospel. And as we do so, I think we're going to see just how focused we have become on its accumulation of things. We're going to see how wealth, and I think especially money in probably our context here in the West, deceives us to its purpose of trying to of us trying to use it for power and identity. And so I, by the time we finish, my prayer to God is, is we become free from his power. Free from his power over our lives. And then we want to think about how we bring it into line with God's design and purpose for it. So that's what we're going to be doing when it comes to it this morning. So my text is more of a springboard than an exposition. But it shall be fine. It shall be fine. And for many of us, oh, I'm going to say for all of us, we would like to experience the promise of the 10th verse. We would like God to bless us. We would like life to be a bit more comfortable. We would like some more things. We would just like it. No matter how pious we may feel we are and how committed we are to the principles of you know, living frugally and compared to past generations, we really don't even begin to practice that. So, But we, we want more. And so as we hear these words... They begin to challenge, and even those of us who are vehemently anti the prosperity gospel are tempted in exactly the same way. And in fact, I want to say some of our vehemence might be because of such a raw nerve in our lives. The things we get angry about the most are often the things we struggle with the greatest. This is part of what it is in our wrestle against sin, my friends. But we often allow our minds to wander and to wonder in collecting far more things than is necessary. Mm. And so, as we read through these things, and these verses are taken out of context by all sorts of wind nuts and heretics, but verse 9 is a clause again, that you must honour the Lord first. There is no verse 10 without verse 9, you must honour him. That means he becomes first, foremost, front and centre, not just in what we give, but in the purpose in which we are doing it by. The motivation. He needs to be number one. And so we're going to be thinking about that this morning. I can't cover everything this morning, as you may well imagine. Uh, so I have some recommended books, as I always like to do so in these more tricky subjects. I will start with the slimmest one, work my way through the fitness. So uh, firstly, John Piper, living in the light, money, sex and power, making the most of three dangerous opportunities. It's free to, to download online from DesiringGod.org. It's a free, and in fact most Desiring God books are free to download. Uh, and John Piper's probably one of the most prolific writers of our generation by a very long way. It's a fantastic little book. It's not very thick. It's not heavy, as you might tell you someone to expect from someone of Mr. Piper's mind. But it's a really easy engagement. And friends, it challenges you to the core. So, number one recommender. Uh, number two, the book that I think is my overall recommendation for every Christian to read when they're thinking about what they're doing with terms of wealth. Redeeming Money by Portrait, How God Reveals and Reorientates Our Hearts. I'll be quoting out this this morning. He has a way of preaching and teaching that feels like you are under the surgeon's knife. Profoundly. In a way that doesn't feel invasive. And it's just a very helpful book in thinking about some of the reality of why it's a problem. Uh, a book I read probably 15 years ago, it's, it's got a slightly different cover now, it's in reprint. Uh, Richard Foster, Money, Sex and Power, The Challenge of a Disciplined Life. Fantastic books. Really, really helpful books on this matter. I've got 40 minutes to talk about what we're going to talk about today. I can't cover it all. There is probably about oh, 15 hours reading, maybe tops, all three books. 
So if, if you're going to buy any one, that's definitely that one, redeeming money, uh, and then work your way through the other two. But that's it. The hardback's free online. This book, uh, Eddie was went to the London Men's Convention several years ago. John Pack was a keynote speaker. Um, he wasn't running it. We paid for our tickets in central London for the day. And he gave everybody who went three hardback books, which cost more than the value of the ticket. So all the, he gave away more than he was gifted to come and preach. Mm. I like people like that. Yeah. Mm. I really like them. And these are not paperbacks. These are hardback books that are expensive. And the three, and just really helpful. And every time you do anything with desire and God, it's the same thing. They give away more than the cost of your going there. Mm. And, just, and they turned up. There was 10,000 men. 30,000 books from the States. Brought them in. We asked to preach, gave more weight to everyone as they came through the door. Here you are, take us away, here's a blessing from the Lord. So when he's talking about money not having a hold on him, there may be some, something deeper there than even just the content of the book. So there, there's my little helpful recommendations before I get into the text and upset most of you. Um, if not all of you, in a loving way, of course. Um, but you can't help upset people when you talk about wealth and money, especially in a Western context. In fact, Jesus talks about wealth and money an awful lot if you read through the Gospels. Yeah. More, more than we want to imagine. Um, it's probably the second most talked about subject in all of Jesus' teaching. Yeah. The first is how. Second is money. You can see where the journey may be going. Friends, at the centre of each one of us, here's, here's the problem, and I'm saying we're going to springboard this and thinking about wealth, and we'll, we'll bring it back ourselves back to the text as we move through. At the centre of all of this, each one of us. No, I'm going to start. That'd be helpful. Um, is the need to try and define ourselves? We all ask the question fairly regularly: Who am I? Who am I? And so, when we're asking these questions, we spend a lot of time trying, then, in light of the question, and rightly so, because questions should provoke a response, to define ourselves. And we will pick many different ways to do that. Because of who we are, our identity, and our purpose, sometimes it's projected from us and by us more demonstratively than our words ever could make it possible. We often will not say things, but in the reality of our hearts, we are trying to project a certain image, identity of ourselves, in order to fit in, in order to um, find our purpose and our place in society, to find it in the context of our small groups, and our, our friendship groups, and our family, in our wider community, and in all these different things. And so, uh, this often happens not so much in the wider talking when it comes to the level of the things we've been talking about this morning, though for some people it may, but often it happens in the private conversations we have with ourselves. You talk to yourself an awful lot if you haven't realised. <laughs> Your number one counsellor is you. You, during the day, make thousands of thousands of micro decisions based on your own internal reflection and that which you're seeking to portray. All of us do. All of us, all of us. And so if they're not rooted in the right place, they're going to end up getting very messed up in the wrong place rather rapidly. And so this really often only comes to a, a head or a crisis when we feel that who we are trying to be, our identity, and it can be a multiple plethora of things, isn't quite doing what we hoped it would do. And so those moments we tend to run to the things that we use to shore up our identity and reassert how we feel we must be seen. We all do it, friends. Every single one of us. It's terrifying if you actually reflect on your life deeply. And there's no way around it. Wealth is one of the primary ways we do this. It's not the only way, but what we own or what we have or what we have in order to get what we own or what we have is one of the primary ways we define ourselves. In fact, in the West, it's almost without fail. 
And we don't even realise how much of a stuff, grip this stuff's got on us. And so I would like to read you an excerpt out of Paul Tripp's book. Because I feel if someone can say it better than you, you might as well let them say it. And here we go. You cannot understand money, and not um, money and wealth, if you do not understand who you are. And money is one of the principal ways you demonstrate who you think you are. There is no better indicator of the identity you have assigned to yourself than the way you use your money. Why does one person proudly throw money around? Why does another person use his or her money to buy all the cultural markers of success? Why is that neighbour of yours so proudly vocal about their charity giving? Why has another person never been able to stay out of debt? Why does a couple quietly give away such a big portion of their income? Why is your friend so gripped with money fears? Why does she struggle with envy and embarrassment whenever she's around friends who are more wealthy than her? Why does he try and hide the fact that he grew up in poverty? Why did Jesus talk about this topic more than any other? Why is money such a big deal? Why are some of us never satisfied even though we have so much money? And why are some of us content with so little? The answer to all of these questions is identity. In a fundamental way, the drama of identity often plays out in the arena of money. You and I again and again make clear who we think we are by the way that we use our money. So I want to get you to think biblically about identity so that you can live rightly when it comes to your money. I think that's really helpful. I think it's very observant. I, always, whenever he writes, he's, he's a counsellor and pastor by discipline, so observance is one of his really strong points, especially in the cultural context. But can you see what the problem is? It's one of the means we use. That's when we come to texts like we find ourselves today. Hence why we go, yes, I want that. So when we go home, we, we fantasize about those holidays that we want to have, we can't afford, or the way we're going to spend our money, or the things that we might be able to buy us, and how we can lift our <coughs> status and make ourselves feel better. We don't realize just how much power wealth has over us until it will not do that which we desire it to do, to shore us up, to define us, to keep our status. We have no idea until it's touched, friends, and I think God is very gracious to us because he doesn't touch it anywhere near as harsh as it needs to be. Mm. It's a love of God to us. But he's gentle with us about these issues, but today we're going to crescendo this down. You see, here's the problem. Here's why wealth, possessions, money, linking it back to who we are, that we use it to try and define ourselves, becomes a problem. Because what we do with our wealth is we ask it to do for us what only Jesus can. We ask it to do for us what only Jesus can. Give me an identity. Only Jesus can give us an identity of anything of worth or value. Comfort me. Only Christ can truly comfort you. Rescue me from my existential crisis. Only the gospel can show you who you are in light of the majesty of Christ and your need of him. And so we use these things in order to, we ask it to do for us what only Jesus can ever really do. And in reality then, that means that money, possessions, wealth, whatever it happens to me, it doesn't have any pound notes, but for today's moment I'm going to use those phrases interchangeably, is that wealth has become a substitute saviour. It's become a substitute saviour. Because we've looked to it to give us an identity and a value and a purpose and a comfort, and when it fails, we get frustrated, we get angry and jealous. And we start trying to gather more things whilst we know it's failing, but we keep running to it. Rather than running to Jesus, we run from him to our wealth to comfort and define us in a way that only Jesus ever can do. We want it to save us, and it can't. When we're on a bad day, we try and use it as a means of atonement, get some retail therapy, feel better about myself. That's an atonement system. I feel bad, I feel better, if I get this, this will make me whole. We're asking it to do what only Jesus can ever do for us. And often we look around our culture and say, oh, our culture is so consumerist, I can't believe the way the West is going, have you not seen it? Friends, we are no different. 
We have this obsessive ideology of accumulation of wealth. Most of us. And we are more affected by what it is than we want to admit. No matter how mature we are, no matter how long we've been on the road, and no matter what we feel our maturity in Christ is. I'm telling you as your pastor that this stuff has more hold on my heart than it should be allowed. And I could get on my knees before the Lord and ask him to rescue me from it and a plethora of other substitute saviors that I run to to come for me. All roots in trying to find an identity outside of Christ. And so if it doesn't apply to you, great, but it applies to me. We become so fixated on gathering it that we're almost too afraid to mention giving of money in church. Some of you will be sat there thinking, he's only mentioning money because the church wants to get money out. It's all they ever want to do. <laughs> yeah, well, um, by the last we're thinking, oh, my friends, yeah, exactly. <laughs> or we go, well, give, Lord. Because you promised to give me back. And so I can hoard away more things. If I give my 10%, you're bound to give me 50% back. Because I'll have more than I started with. So it's just good economics, Lord. You know, and We don't say those things, but in our heart, in our mind, that's what's going on. Missionary giving, just look at it in the life of the Western church, friends. It's poorer than it's ever been historically. It's horrendous. Some of it, we're not even sending people because of, of a comfort issue. They don't want to go. The missionaries of old, they put all their belongings in their coffin, they nailed the lid, took it with them and said, you can bury me in that because I ain't coming home. Mm. <coughs> Are you going for a three-week mission trip? No, no, I'm going to die. And I, when I'm done, they can bury me in the box my possessions are in. Massive game change. <laughs> and I, I just want us to think this morning about some of the reality of when we allow money to have a hold on us and possessions have a hold on us and not need to gather more to have a hold on us, what that looks like in reality and practice for missions for a moment. Just for missions for a moment. And I want you to think across this globe, which is cruising towards the eight, seven and a half, eight billion mark, whatever it happens to be, how many people do you think have never had the opportunity to hear the good news of Jesus that you are enjoying this morning? 3.2 billion people. Friends, 3.2 billion people have never had the chance to hear the good news of Jesus. Never. That are alive on planet Earth today. That's nearly half of the global population. I've never heard the good news that you don't have to bow to idols and you don't have to find identity in things that you can trust in a God who loves you and saves you and came to die for you and liberate you from your sins to give you an identity, a hope and a future to reside in you, to liberate you, to set you free, to take you to heaven and eternity with all his saints. They've never heard it. 3.2 billion people. And of all the money that ever gets given to missions, and that includes, I would talk with it all over the world now, they receive less than 1% of all the money. God help us. Half of the planet's never heard the gospel, and we're hoarding 99% of it. Oh, would it cost more in the West? Yeah, I know it costs more in the West. Less than 1% of missionary giving goes to the half of the planet that's never heard the gospel. Do you see how much this stuff affects us? Do you see how much it affects our churches? Affects our souls? That's all. I'm, I'm challenged thinking through this sermon. When I'm sitting there hearing 3.2 billion people have never heard the good news of Jesus, that's double the population of India. Never heard the good news of Jesus. Never had a chance. The Bible's clear, no Jesus, no eternal life. No way around it. I sat in my office and watched it and I wept. 3.2 billion souls. Imagine their faces. There's a wonderful video with all these different people who saw the different colours of their skin and all these different looks. I think they've never heard the gospel of Jesus. They've never heard the gospel of Jesus. Because we're more interested when we get to a text in Proverbs thinking, well, if I give, how can I get more back? The travesty, friends. 
Oh, it's the time we're not even moved to tears about. Let alone to action. We're all broken. The idol of money must fall before the cross of Christ. The cause of Christ in the world means our view of money and wealth and possessions must change. The cause of Christ. But so often we spend millions of pounds on church buildings to make them attractive and comfortable for us on a Sunday morning. Millions. And I do mean millions. Across our conurbation in the past 15 years, we're talking in the realms of over 10 to 12 million pounds spent on church buildings. 10 to 12 million pounds. I'm not judging them, I'm just making a point. It's an analogy. 3.2 billion people have heard the gospel of Christ. Men and women need training and need sending and need support. They do, friends. Whilst people are perishing, we have a comfy pew. And I love great sounds. I want to sit in a nice seat. And I understand all those things. I'm not trying to be like, feeling like I'm a a Marxist revolution from the pulpit this morning. (laughs) (laughs) But friends, there there is a problem. Do you know how bad the problem gets? I want to tell you something. Well, that's a song you should never mind. A friend of mine, I wasn't going to quote his name anyway, his role 10 years ago was to fundraise for um, a certain Christian organisation who wanted to build a new building. The old one, in all fairness, was falling down, it was leaking, and it was terrible. So I'm going to be fair. So his job was to fundraise, and he and I would sit and talk, and he's a dear friend of mine, How's it going? What's happening? What's some of the obstacles you have? He said, Ian, I cannot get people to give unless I offer them something, like their name on a brick or a plaque on the wall so that everyone can know what they're giving. Mm-hmm. They won't give unless they can have a brick on the wall. And those words were 10 years ago, and it stuck and wrong in my head. God help us. Mm-hmm. Give and let it go. Yeah. That was your name. Of the Lamb's Book of Life, who cares who knows what it is? <laughs> but friends, we do it because we're trying to use our wealth to say, Look at me, look how generous I am. When the Lord doesn't give us back, we can point to the brick and say, God, I gave it, why are you giving it back? Friends, it's sinful. Look at the difference when you seek to have an offering across the majority and virtually every. Church evangelism in the West. That is for the training of pastors, the planting of churches in ungospel communities. And friends, there is ungospel communities right in our congregation. I can guarantee you. I know because we've been around praying about it and researching and, and praying that one day the Lord will send the people that we can plant churches in ungospel places. And please pray. I ask you for your money, I'm asking for your prayers. Pray. Because they need Christ. They need Christ. Let alone take them off into whole people groups. We will get little giving. <coughs> Grumbles, why, why not? Can we, all this stuff comes out. But the minute we want to do it for a building, how much flying like it's going out of fashion? A church that I know needed a new building for whatever reason. Down to the elders and the Lord with them, whether they need one or not. That's not my point I'm going to make. So one Sunday morning, bearing in mind, 1% of all wealth goes to these people groups. Which is a small block because missions doesn't get very much anyway. And on top, you know, thinking about training people, sending them into work for Christ. They decided to take an offer up one Sunday morning. Over a million pounds in the pot. For a new building. Now, bless God, generous people. However... Would you got a million pounds in the pot to go support missions for the next 50 years? Mm. Worries me. Mm. Worries me. We seem to have missed the rebuke of Haggai 1, 3 to 11. Friends, and I, it's not about them, this is about us in the room. I, they were just serving as examples not to be 
judgmental, but sometimes you need to get these things in real figures. <laughs> Haggai 1 is, oh, it's the Old Testament, I don't know if it counts for us that, and surely the whole of the Bible counts for us. This is what Haggai writes. The word of the Lord came by the hand of Haggai the prophet. It is time for you yourselves to dwell in paneled houses, is it time, sorry, while the house of the Lord lies in ruins. Now therefore, says the Lord of hosts, consider your ways. You have so much and hard to little. You eat, but you never have enough. You drink, and you'll never have your fill. You clothe yourselves, but no one is warm. And he earns wages and does so, and puts them in back with holes in. Thus says the Lord of the hosts, consider your ways. Go to the hills and bring wood and build a house, that I may take pleasure in it, and that I may be glorified, says the Lord. You look for much, and behold, it came to little. And when you brought it home, it blew away. Why, declares the Lord of hosts? Because my house lies in ruins, while each one of you busies himself with his own house. Therefore the heavens above you have withheld the dew, and the earth has withheld its produce. I have called for a drought on the land and the hills, on the grain and the new wine, on the oil and the ground, brings forth on man and beast and on all their labourers. Translate to the house of the Lord into the New Testament church, the furthering of the kingdom of God across the globe for the case of Christ. You want to understand how the temple parallels into the new? It's not just us, friends. It's the cause of Christ covering the waters of the earth like the glory of God covers it. It's the extension of his kingdom. You can't help but think Haggai has got a real prophetic word for the Western church. Comfort, comfort, comfort. We don't understand why nothing's happening. And we don't understand why we have so little. And then we turn around and see what God's told us why. We have to let those words ring out. 3.2 billion people have never heard the good news of Jesus. People in our conurbation have never had someone sit down with them and explain to them the wonders of the gospel of Christ, eternal life in Jesus that they can have, that will transform them, turn them around, rip them upside down and put a whole brand new way of thinking in their mind and it's all for free. Friends. So instead the misuse of money by so many of us, for the status of identity and wealth and power is exponential. The culture of the world has gripped the heart of the saints. The American dream has landed in Britain, friends. Believe it or not, it's here. The American gospel, the American dream, is working its way out in our lives, and it's subtle. It's deceptive because it's demonic. Because it has to be demonic, because when we hoard things, we stop giving to global missions, and the kingdom of God isn't as extended, and people aren't hearing the good news of Jesus, and I think that sounds demonic to me. That sounds like a war that's on that we don't just have to take from us, it just has to give us more. The spiritual war is not always taken from you, it's sometimes giving you an awful lot more. An awful lot more. And so often, so much of this thinking has crept into us that we assume... That when we do give, and the Bible does call us to give exponentially generously, by the way. We're going to get there if we pile on through this morning. That's the key of our text, that's the key of scripture, to be generous with everything we have as the Lord's. But when we get something, even we immediately assume the more we have is because God is blessing us. But then, when we start considering what we do with that blessing, we kind of start to ask ourselves a lot of questions. It's a question that the Bible asks. And the question that I would want to always ask is why would God give us an abundance of the very thing that draws us away from him? So often. Here's what 1 Timothy 6 says. But those who desire to be rich fall into temptation, into a snare, into many senseless and harmful desires that plunge people into ruin and destruction. For the love of money is the root of all kinds of evil, it is through this craving that some have wandered from the faith and pierced themselves with many pangs. Why would God want us to wander? It can't be a mess at that point. Friends, I'm not saying we live on crackers and a glass of water. That's not where I'm going with this this morning. But I do think we're trying to hold on to something that God wants us to let go of. Far more than we can dream or imagine. Friends, its impact is so profound that if we lost it, we would lose it. If we lost it, we would lose it. We'd be sat there thinking, 
Why has God, God done this to me if he loves me? I'm his child and I've been faithful. We ask those questions. Now, I'm not saying they're not unfair pastoral questions, but there's a problem at the root of the question. We have more than enough. Charles Wesley, the great English revivalist, 700, 700 years ago, he started on a salary and the Lord used his life and he wrote many books. Him and his brother wrote over a thousand hymns that we sing regularly today. He rode a horseback across this nation. He went overseas and set up missionary communities. He preached the gospel wherever he could in the open air. Profoundly used of God. As a result, he wanted his books and his writings. So when you sell books, guess what happens? Money comes in. What do you think he did with his salary? Kept it the same as he did when he started as a poor man preaching in the open air. Never changed his salary the whole of his life. Now, we can have a debate whether that's right or wrong. That's just been for another day. But look at the disposition of his heart. Just because I got more doesn't mean they're going to keep more. It means they're going to give more away. And he paid for churches to be built. And he sent missionaries all over the world. In fact, that man was in prison here. He preaching the gospel of Jesus in this country. If you go down Paul today to the car park by the quay, mm -hmm. on the wall, it says, Charles Wesley yeah. was imprisoned here for proclaiming the gospel of Christ. Oh, God. Oh, they're the sort of men I want to follow. Yes. We can debate your theology later, mate. <laughs> My life. He wasn't just willing to give his money away, he was willing to be poor and imprisoned. He established church as important because there was no church. Everywhere he went, he preached the gospel, started a church, so the thing would go and have his wealth he would give. <coughs> Friends, we have to get to the point with money, with wealth and possessions, that we can actually pray the prayer of Habakkuk. Another Old Testament prophet. Habakkuk 3 says this. Though the fig tree should not blossom, no fruit be on the vines, the produce of the oil fa olive fail, the fields yield no food, the flock be cut off from the fold, and there be no herd in the stalls. Yet I will rejoice in the Lord, and I will take joy in the God of my salvation. Come on! They're the sort of men we need to be listening to. Not the clowns that want all our money and tithing the tithe, and if you give to me, you'll get it back a hundredfold. They're liars! <laughs> And the hand of God is against them, and one day he will deal with them, if not in this life and the next. But friends, if nothing happens, if he says, if the harvest fails, if my sheep die, if I've got nothing around me, if nothing works, yet I will rejoice in the Lord my God. I will take joy in the God of my salvation. Friends, it's much easier to say that than do that. But friends, we need to pray earnestly that God gives us a heart to receive these things. To hear these things, to let them filter into the centre of our very being. So when that time comes, if God tests our words, and I think over the next two years he might be testing our words somehow, then we've got to get ourselves to the place here. I'm preaching in such directness and probably far more exaltatively than I would normally, even for me, because I am trying to prepare you for that which is to come. It's coming. There was an old song by a Christian hippie in the 70s, became a Christian. The line of this song was, life is filled with guns and war. All of us got trampled on the floor. I wish we'd all been ready. A piece of, a bag of gold could buy a piece of bread. I wish we'd all been ready. It's too, t there's no time to change your mind. The song has come and you've been left behind. Jesus. He understood something profound in the gospel. That Jesus is of the greatest value. So if, if the world goes to hell in a handcart, if the financial markets crash out hard in the 1920s, if everything goes bang, our God is still on the throne. And if we die, we go to heaven with him, our God is still on the throne. So whether we are plenty or where we are what the words of Paul, we will praise the Lord. We will praise him. If God chooses to give us things more than we need, and he does, I, I, I need to almost extenuate this out now. We do have a God who blesses us. We do have a God that gives us more than we need. We have a God who lets us keep more than we need. 
We have a God that lets us have more clothes than, we, than most people in the world could dream of ever owning. We have a God who lets us, you know, I always find it profound, profound. I don't understand how, but you know, when you get weary and tired and you pray, Lord, I need a break and I need a holiday, I don't know how I'm going to do it, and he, and he turns up with one, and I'm thinking, you've answered my prayer here, but I know friends across the globe have got nothing. Why have you answered me? Not, I, mean, I don't know. All I know is God is benevolent and he's sovereign and I'm going to let him work it out. Friends, God does want you to enjoy things. It's not like, let's go around like a bunch of monks, taking a vow of poverty and God may actually do that and that's fine. But I also believe that God is a generous God. We've all got nice clothes, we've all very comfortable here this morning. We have a wonderful church building that is a miracle for how much we ever pay for its usage. And we have a sound system that most of you sat here were never even part of the process when we came here. It was paid for by the generosity of people. Out of, out of their, they gave out of their nothing. We've always been a small church and significantly poor church. And somehow God meets the bills. And we don't know how. And God is generous to us. We don't want to take that away. And we try and steward all that we have to the glory of God. But friends, even if God blesses us, it's not because we've got something special. It's just because he's loving. Yeah. And it's never for the promise that we get to hoard it. What scripture does is it challenges us beautifully. Mm-hmm. 2 Corinthians 9, 6 says, He who re- sows sparingly will reap sparingly. Whoever sows bountifully will reap bountifully. Why is he in sound like Kenneth Copeland? I am not. <laughs> the New Testament says, and we have to ask ourselves the question, what is one of the most important questions always asked? Why? Because if God can't trust you to give the little you have, why would he trust you when you have more that you're going to give more away? Why would he? Why does... If God gives us more, it's because he knows we've been faithful what we have. Therefore, now we have more. The challenge is to give more away. The more you receive, the more responsibility is on our shoulders to give more away. And so for me, as the Western church, and even as a church that is poor by many church standards, but not as poor by a lot of my friends' standards, I think what we have, we have responsibility to 3.2 billion people who have heard the gospel. We have a responsibility to people in this nation who have never heard Jesus. With a little bit we have, and last time I checked, Jesus isn't bothered. The amount is bothered about the heart. Yeah. And if all we've got is two brass pennies, we'll put two brass pennies in and we say, God, for your kingdom. Friends, it has to begin to move us. It has to begin to change us. We haven't got things because of any other reason than God's benevolence to us. And so we need to be have minds and hearts that are open. Friends, in the final analysis, God will ask you what you did with your wealth. Mm-hmm. He's not to ask you if you were a little boy or a little girl. Did you keep the Ten Commandments? Part of that question, that final day, that text he preached through in 1 Corinthians 3, the gold, silver, wood, hay and stubble, Part of that question is, what did you do with everything I gave you? Because everything you have from the Lord's friend. Every penny you earn. No, I got my job because I qualified. Yeah, but it comes from the Lord. He gave you the ability. Yeah, but it's by the sweat of my brow who gave you life and breath. Mm. All that we have. Every penny. Everything we own is from the Lord. So he can ask us what we did with it. Because it all comes from him. And he's going to ask us, were we generous for the sake of the kingdom of God? Did we give faithfully into the life of the local church? There's a massive challenge in scripture all the way through. We don't have time to even pick it up today. Did we support people on the mission field? And that's a challenge to me and decisions I've made in my own personal life that will be changing. I've always like God, I don't really have it to give. And he's like, well, you have more than they do, so give it away. Mm-hmm. Well, we just generous act informally as well as formally. But we have people with big hearts. Not fools with our money, because I think today they'd be a fool. What God calls to do is steward our things, to understand how much we've got, and to trust Him and pray, and when He says give, we do. Or did we just do the minimum? Just to make sure that everything was kept in balance and equilibrium. Did we first put our own comfort first and God got what was left? 
I feel we've been drunk in abundance and we have wardrobes stacked with clothes and comfy cars and nice food and bellies full and fridges that are full. And we say, well, now I've spent more money and enjoyed all my pleasures. God, I've got a little bit left and you can have it. Until we say, God, what do you want from me this month? Let's start with what you want and I'll work my rest of my life around what you want this month. Because if we trust him in that, I'm telling you, the promise that we have here right at the beginning of our text, he will meet our needs. That's the promise of scripture. He said, he said we can test him in Malachi. He says we can rob him, but as we give, we can test him. And he, if we, with right motives and right motives, I want to give because you give me everything, and I don't know how I'm going to make it all work, I'm going to trust you, and I'm going to, I'm going to do what I need to do, and I'm going to pray through everything, and pray about how I steward my money. He says, you can trust me, and I'll throw the winners out. Why? So you can give me more life. So we can be a generous people. Friends, you don't need wealth, status, power, or anything else to bring you an identity, because it will fail. You need to receive that which is yours in Christ. And then live your life out from the riches of who you are in Jesus. The riches. God is a generous God. In fact, he's beyond generous. Be beyond generous. I, 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 just, I look at my life and know I live so a very generous God. But I am pleading with you this morning as your, one of your elders and as someone who pastors you to trust him by committing to be extravagantly more generous to his cause. To do so because he is worthy and his gospel needs proclaiming that the cause of Christ across the globe needs advancing. Needs advancing. Needs advancing with our lives. Not all of us can go. We can't go, we said. But we don't do nothing because that's disobedience. Friend, men and women need to be sent. They need to be sent into our local areas, local communities, local gospel outposts all across the congregation all across the nation, all across Europe. Do you know less than half a percent of Europe is evangelical Christian? Less than half a percent of Europe is professing Christian. That's like a spit across the ocean. The UK is about 2%, maybe one and a half. Terrifying. The mission of God is vital. And so when I think about well, if I first think about God, what can I do and how can I serve you? People need to be saved so that people may be saved from hell by hearing and responding to the gospel of Christ mm-hmm. and accepting the good news that they have heard. And I am pleading with you, do not use God's generosity to feather your own nest, but instead use it to further his kingdom. Knowing that he will do miracles, that he will make things ends tie up that you can't imagine. My own life is a witness to that. I could share you story on story on story of God's generosity, sure as many of you could do. Miracles. Giving up to study my job. Very successful job with a good career. Being given a car. Never been going holiday before. God providing miraculously. God providing things that I just can't even dream of. I don't deserve any of it. I don't expect it to come a second time, but I thank God for it coming first. Because God is abundantly generous towards us. But even if you don't receive, even if you give away and you live in some form of Western discomfort, and I was talking to some friends here last week, and we were talking about accommodation. And they said, compared to where we come from, even the little we have is abundantly beyond what more people around us have. But it made me stop and think, like, hello, how much of this stuff got my heart? So even if God doesn't ever respond, even if, and there's plenty of Christians who would die in poverty, friends. There's kids in the favelas in Brazil who will go to bed with starving bellies tonight. People that may not wake up tomorrow morning because they're so... They love the Lord Jesus with all of their heart. We have friends 
you know, I think of our friends, dear friends in India who often feed people who have no food. Three children live with them, they've got nothing. So people, there's no guarantee, because that's not the point. The point is Jesus is worth it. And we sat there, Mike and I, and we need the time before. These people who have nothing are the most generous people towards the cause of Christ I have ever, ever come across in my life. I'm actually going that one up. Um, ever in my life. You go around their house, poor. The worst poverty I've ever seen, I, I would go as far as saying. Four of them in one room have nothing. And they come in and they bring this more little serve of sweet. And they don't, and you know as they give you that, that's probably their, their blessing for the month. That's, that's their little treat. You don't have anything else. And they're willingly gave it because they just want it to be a blessing. God, make us a generous people. Make us a generous people. And even if we don't get back, God is worth all of it. Friends, the cause of Christ across the globe, the 3.2 billion that have been reached, the exponential millions in our own continent that have never had the gospel explained to them. All those churches. Good for it. Only the gospel explaining in a place to receive Jesus. That requires men and women and time and support to do those things. Friends, my prayer is that you don't feel berated, you feel challenged in order to go home and seek God's face and asking God, what would you have me do with all that you've given me? I tell you, if you want to hear God speak, ask him what he can do with your wealth. All of a sudden, Things begin to happen in our soul because the Lord will lead us to, to be a generous people. I'm going to pray. Michael's going to come and lead us in communion. And in God's providence, delayed from last week and into this week, before this week's prepared, we're going to potentially have something serious to pray into. Father, we pray that you would not let money grab our hearts. God, but you let the gospel grab our hearts. Father, we desperately need you. Lord, and I pray this morning that where we have allowed wealth to use as a means of identity in our own lives to define us, God, I pray that you will cause that to be broken as we trust in you, God. And even when as, you, as those things change, God, and our hearts want what God will sustain us, God, I pray we'll become people marked out by gospel generosity. <laughs> Lord, this is not about me asking people's money. A belongs to you and B is never of ours anyway. But Lord, we want to see your kingdom extended. And so God, we pray that you would move our hearts, God. And God, I pray you break our hearts. God, this the figure of over three billion people never hearing the gospel of Christ. Lord, how do we help troubled people to send them so people may hear the good news, God? We pray that you would, you would find us good stewards of all that we have as a body here. God, we pray this in Jesus' name and for his glory. Amen. Amen.